Okay. Okay, I'm Linda Power, and I've just been uh, a member of um, Sierra Club for over 20 years, but active in the last year and a half, and I've met some really fine people. Um, the person that you're going to hear from today, Douglas Kent, has been a friend of mine for almost 25 years, and I get to tell stories on him, which is probably why he left the room. <laughs> We met um, at a corporate team building event. He was working for Orange Coast College as an instructor of sailing. And we raced on shields boats, which are long boats. And I remember the things that Doug taught me when he was teaching me about sailing fast and sailing well. He would say, Linda, if you're going to do that, why don't you just throw an anchor over? So I learned not to do those kinds of things, and I never forgot, and still to this day when I'm racing, well, I'm not racing recently, but when I'm racing, I remember Doug's words, if you're going to do that, just throw an anchor over, because it's not helping. So Doug's been a, a very wonderful friend. He's taught me things about poison oak and how to get rid of it. Um, we've hiked the hillsides, as many of you have done, and um, most recently we went on a hike and he was pulling things off of trees and we visited botanical gardens and he was pulling things off of little branches and he said, here, try this. So over these years, Doug has uh, done a lot in recent years. He's gotten two master's degrees. I lost touch with you during that time while you were busy at school. And, um, but we, we've done some adventures recently and I was impressed by the things that are in our gardens, in the hillsides, and as we hike that are nutritious and valuable. And he's gonna give you some really good information um, and save some time at the end for you to ask questions and such. Doug is currently an expert in ecological land management. He's a professional educator teaching in the urban ecology uh, department at USC. He also is an adjunct, adjunct professor at the Center for Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly. And he's also an instructor in the UCLA Extension Program. He loves teaching, he's inspiring, and you will uh, enjoy what he has to teach us today. Please join me in wel welcoming Doug. Makes you kind of want to meet that guy, doesn't it? <laughs> going on YouTube and that's why this normally I can uh, carry a room like this no problem I'm so grateful for the good turnout anybody know what this plant is Cherry. cloves cloves it's the golden concurrent ribes yeah so it's ribes it just grows at Cal Poly and I just was walking by it and uh, before I forage it I took this picture and it's just delicious an old time uh, concurrent would have been jams it would have been all kinds of food next picture any um, California natives here? All right, mostly natives. This is my group. Any foragers here? One, two, three-ish? Inspired, okay. <laughs> go, go Marcia. Um, any, anybody ever eat snails? Yeah, oh my God, this is my group. Because I was gonna say this presentation is for the non-snail eaters, but we're beyond that with this group. So snails, this is the um, 
Snails are actually so good for you. They're packed with omega-3s. Any mollux is what we would have been snails' main predator in historic times because they are just so loaded. They're, if you think about it, snails are the protein with, um, that are closest to the sun. So it's the richest, cleanest, most digestible protein. It is incredible for brain health and muscle recovery. So if you're in any kind of athlete, you really want those omega-3s pumping through your system for muscle recovery. And we can grow these like nothing in California. All right. Um, this is just an open, um, just to lead off, you guys know what a superfood is? I'm going to, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but I'll, I'll give you a, an analogy here or a metaphor. If you think about a car, um, protein for a car is the chassis and the hard stuff. So that's the stuff you really see. The carbohydrates are your fuel, is what you put in the tank, and it gets that thing going. But what you need is the transfer of power, right? From those carbohydrates to that protein, you need that transfer of energy to get that car moving, and that's where superfoods come in. They're all your oils. They're your CV joint fluids, your transmission fluids, and your engine oils. And... Um, and they just absolutely help with your health and well-being. They drive your immunity. They increase bone density and improve respiratory health. And that's what a superfood is. They help your body um, regenerate itself. And this is carob. It's kind of tough to see it. Um, but it's a common weed um, in California. And it produces a fruit that, has anybody ever had carob? Oh, it's delicious, and it just grows wildly uh, in Southern California. I have my little carob hot spots, and the fruit is coming into season right now. Next slide. How many California natives are superfoods? How many California native plants can you find in your grocery store? Very few, and I'll explain why that phenomenon exists, but very few California natives can be found in our grocery stores, and very few are sold in health food stores, and very few are commonly available. What you can find are, um, you cannot find our native blackberry in the stores, but it is a superfood. Cattail is an incredible food if you've ever forged it. It would have sustained native Californians for everything, building materials, food, health remedies. The elderberry is gift from our mother. It's just one of the one of the all-time greatest plants, both native and non-native. Um, all your mackerel algae, which is the kelps and the seaweeds, are superfoods loaded with everything we need. And then the picture that we can't see is the native nettle, which cannot be found in Southern California. We, we don't have the native nettle down here, but that would have been another superfood. Um, next slide. How, how many weeds are superfoods? crazy. That's the mind-boggling thing. We were just talking about this earlier, that if you go to one of those bougie restaurants, they'll, you'll pay more for a superfood weed <laughs> than you will for the lettuce. It's just weird. And 80% of all weeds are edible, even more than 80%. 40% of those are superfoods. Like, just drive your body. And you, so this juxtaposition between power and what's available in environment and what we're actually seeking out is the emphasis of this presentation tonight is to explore this this is um this is el capitan state park in santa barbara the northern edge of it it's a hiker biker spot you can only camp there if you bike in everything i go there all the time to forage this area so i go to the coast and we'll bring up the mussels and get the kelp and bring it in but all the plants in the foreground are all weeds they just can't control it and it just provides incredible nutrition to groups like this you just feed yourself from the land and um and you know like beer just a mile away so it's perfect <laughs> Um, so what explains the differences is your mother is what explains the differences. Hominids. Hominids have been around for 3.5 million years. Lucy, you guys know Lucy? She's our mother and she had a distinct impact on the land. Um, opposing thumbs, bipedal, big cranium. She interacted with the land completely different than any other species at the time. And just imagine this, Lucy's trucking around one day, never found a plant before, she eats it, 
and she's able to pass her toxins a little bit better. She's able to poop a little bit better. And as a consequence, she has more success, more reproductive success because she has more energy. She loves this plant and she learns one lesson right off the bat. And this is millions of years ago. Do not overeat it. Protect it and let it spread. Well, all of a sudden, this plant has a competitive advantage over all other plants because now it's being protected by a species. So we have this developing relationship. And if you fast forward tens and tens of thousands of years, our body is evolving to the very vegetation on the land just as that vegetation is evolving to follow our footprints. It's no wonder our weeds are so edible. They're native to us. And that's why they're so good for us and so delicious. And it's, and they've just learned. So this is chicory. You guys know chicory? It's a weed in California. This picture, I harvested this in Compton, California, of all places in a garden. And I brewed that up. Um, so I made a, a soup out of the leaves, roasted, cut these up, roasted them, and then just made um, coffee out of them. Coffee is, cow, you know, chicory is cowboy coffee. It would, would have sustained everybody heading west. It's a really oily, rich um, tasting cup of tea, and it really does revive your body. It's really good for your digestion. Okay, next slide. So simply put, I think I just did this, is, is, is this whole presentation leans into our historic um, relationship with the land, our mutualistic relationship that we have with hundreds of plants. And we established plants um, not just for foods, but for building materials. We protected those plants that provided our flooring and our roofing and our sidings. We, um, our ropes and our, all our skins, we established these long-term relationships. And, you know, fast forward to the modern era with fossil fuels and we can ditch all those relationships and we can have all those nutrients compacted in little pills and, and we can get our, our things a lot differently now, but we're paying the consequences for it. Our world is on fire and we are seeing that headline every day. And so let's lean back. Let's lean into these historic relationships and see if we can cool the world down and calm the world down and get a little healthier as a consequence. So my goal with this, uh, next slide please, is um, just, to, just to have you appreciate wherever you are. I'm really more of an urban forager, um, uh, just because, anyway, I just love walking out my house, taking a mile walk and bringing this goodness in. And I have something foraged every day without a, a doubt. And this is Saddleback College. For, this is the class I was teaching at Saddleback. Okay, next slide. So all I'm going to do is really quickly talk about protecting your health, everyday foods. So I'll list the stuff that you can find in this community. We could go out and probably find most of this stuff within 100 yards of this building. Um, edible flowers, because flower, eating flowers are so much fun, and it's just a good way to engage people. Uh, poisonous plants. This is really a quick section. I don't think I only have three or four slides. And then just a rousing conclusion. I hope I didn't set myself up there. Next slide. Okay, protecting yourself. So there's um, three risks. Um, we have digestive risk, physical risk, and then legal risk. Next slide. And so digestive risk, the biggest from digestive risk from working with students at Cal Poly, you know, we get all kinds of students from Cal Poly. We get the creative types. We get the academic types. And uh, misidentification is the leading cause of any kind of distress when you're foraging foods. So really, uh, the thing with misidentification, if you can't name it, do not eat it, if you cannot positively name it. And there's so many ways, like Bree knows, um, people go online to Facebook groups and say, is this edible or is this what I think it is? And you'll get instant responses. There's iNaturalist, there's all kinds of tools out there to identify. Food allergies, if you do have food allergies and you're concerned, here's the remedy for food allergies. You just take a little leaf or whatever you're gonna forage, just rub it around the outside of your lips. If you have no reaction, take whatever you're going to eat and put it in your gum like chewing tobacco and do not actually swallow it. If you have no reaction, you're pretty probably good to go. Take that little bit, swallow it, wait 30 to 45 minutes. If you have no reaction, you're not going to have any reaction. I will tell you this, though. I um, do not know of many people that have reactions to foods that your DNA and RNA have evolved to digest. These foods will sync up with your digestive system. Foreign bodies, <laughs> you're already eating these, believe it or not. Uh, 
the FDA allows so much foreign bodies in the food in the grocery stores that you can only clean the bugs out. So you're actually already eating bugs in your grocery store food. It's just not so visible. So the remedy here is always just wash your food when you get it home. And when you wash it, you want to wash it in water that's warmer than the air temperature. And the reason being is um, it creates a pressure differential and you want any toxin on the top of that leaf to be expelled out. So if the water is colder than the air, than the leaf itself, the toxin is pulled in because of that pressure. So you want the water warmer so the toxins get expelled out. So any, even the food that you buy from the grocery store, always wash in water warmer than the temperature of the leaf itself. And that'll be safe. Herbicides, I have a slide for this on how to identify it. Um, metals are a really big concern. We um, are a machine-based society. Brake dust um, is a huge one. Um, tires are is a huge one. And this one, again, is you just really want to make sure that your material is washed and you're not eating within 500 feet of a roadside. Although I've biked from Central Oregon to Mexico and foraged and camped that whole route, and I had to pretty much forage along a road the entire time. So I'll be gone in like five minutes. So, <laughs> no. um, so but you know, um, really, so the rule is don't eat within 500 feet of a road, but if you're in LA, that's impossible. <laughs> Um, and then pathogens, the big one. This is the one that will most disturb you. This is the one that will really, because these others are accumulative, whereas pathogens will react within hours. And you can have all kinds of discomfort. Um, and that is the magic. Anybody ever take a food handling safety course? What's the magic number? 165. 165. If you're worried about pathogens, just take the food to 165, and it kills everything. So if I'm in the fields, like if I do, I do a lot of foraging at Griffith Park for a lot of groups, and that's really LA-ish and so many dogs and we really don't know. So we just bring a big pot of water and just make sure we bring it up to 165 to knock off that stuff. And um, that's how we work with that. Okay, next one. Maybe. From your class of courses, has anybody gotten sick from your foraging courses? Um, I never give out my email address, <laughs> so I'm not too sure. No, actually, no, no, no. I uh, what? If anything, the only thing I hear is like, "Oh, I had the greatest bowel movement." So <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. So. Um, Oh, so it depends. We can talk about that. He, he, we have a cook right here. It really depends on the food. Um, so if it's really a light, small leaf and we don't want to cook out the nutrition, then it's just a flash boil. You're just, it's topical. But it's, if it's a thick leaf like aloe vera or something like this, you're working on something different, then I think it's a deeper boil. But it really depends on the culinary use of it too because uh, you don't really want to cook out the nutrition. Y yeah. That was a complicated question. Ooh. Um, that's why I like working with 19-year-olds. <laughs> um, so herbicides, when you're working in, so I do, you know, doing a lot of work at state parks and federal parks and BMLN, and you never know about what they're going to use on site. And so I'm always leery about pesticides. And so the way, the best way to identify pesticides is just contrast. Some landscape sits in contrast to another landscape. An alarm bell should go off. If there's any kind of delineation at all, you might have some kind of cause for concern. And the delineation can be strips. Um, they'll just take a roundup right up, zoop, and you'll just see a strip of dead stuff. And you just stay away, especially downwind of that strip, because of the drift of that chemical. Shriveled leaves, stems that are isolated in certain parts. Purple leaves, a great sign. Purple is a sign of distress in plants. So any kind of purple leaf, I would stay away from them unless it had actually a purple leaf. Um, yellow spots could mean um, drift, like the pesticide is landing, so it's leaving spots. It didn't actually go where they wanted to, so you have this lot of spotting going on. One type of plant. So if you see a field of only grasses with no broadleaf plants, it means a selective herbicide was used just to kill broadleaf plants. Like they have fertilizers that kill dandelions. What lunatic thought of that? Boggles my mind. But um, so yeah, if there's only one type of plant, then they used a selective herbicide. Um, soils will actually look different. Um, pesticides, whether it's a herbicide or insecticide, 
or rodenticide will actually change the color of the soil. It'll leave a sheen on it. So you can see, so if they lay down a, um, a herbicide that's a pre-emergent, they don't want the young seeds to sprout, you can actually see it because it'll leave a sheen on the soil. It just looks different than the untreated soils. Yeah, next slide. But hopefully I'm going to try to, uh, uh, the idea here is to get you to forage your own property first. And then once you get your own property wired, then you would take this knowledge into the hiking trails and stuff like this. But I do most of my foraging on my property. Um, physical risk, this is the Sierra Club. This slide, everybody knows this slide. First, you're always going to use clothing as a shield. So when you're out, you really want to protect your most vulnerable areas, which in my case are my ankles and my wrists. Um, and so you really long sleeves. I always have when I'm hiking or working in any kind of vegetation, I always have a cap on. So it keeps my head from going just that much further into roses that could cut me or something that would hurt me or poke me. So the, the bill of the hat really protects a, is my, my warning thing. Always when you're in the wild, any garden, dress like a flower. Dark clothes, so um, bees see dark colors as threatening. You're a bear going to rob their honey. And so if you dress like a flower, they'll just go right around you. Wasps will, anything will. Just go be a flower in your environment and be loud. Um, most of your, your confrontations with wildlife is going to be because you spooked them. You just came up on them. So dress like a flower and be loud out there. Do not surprise, you know, the snake, the possum, the bobcat, whatever you might encounter. Your neighbor's dog, in my case. Learn this the hard way, Ugh, especially dealing with prickly pear cactus. Do not touch your face when you're foraging. Do not just, you got to reel yourself in. You do not know where your hands have been and you don't want to bring it into your eyes. Um, if you know anything about prickly pear, they have the glockids, which are the smallest, tiniest, most transportable. You can get glockid here and it travels. And so just trust me, do not touch your face. Um, beware of your surroundings. Um, this would have been a great example. He's standing in a stream in Buck Gully in Corona Del Mar. And um, yeah, that's a tripping hazard. So, you know, just be aware of your surroundings and always be conscious. Be in place, in situ. And then poison oak. I have the next slide on this. You guys are all familiar with poison oak, right? Oh, man. So I, I told you I biked from Central Oregon to Mexico. This was the one. I only Two plants followed me, along with vultures. Um, poison oak, fo yeah. Vultures follow road because the roadkill. So they were always overhead on that bike ride. Um, but yeah, poison oak was along that entire track. And I got it like three or four times during that. Um, yeah, leaves of three, let it be low. But here's the strategy. If you think you've got it, again, wash as soon as you can in slightly warm water in any kind of detergent, if possible, like Dawn. Just anything that breaks oils, you want to get that off of you as soon as possible. If you even have a suspicion that you might have gotten it, immediately get your vulnerable areas, your ankles and your wrist, maybe your face. Um, do not touch your clothing. <laughs> If possible, remove your clothing before jumping in your car. One of my best friends got poison oak, jumped in the car, got out. His wife got in the car. He gave it to her. So just strip before if you think you got it. Um, I'm sure Sierra Club members are really good about bringing spare clothing in their cars just in case. <laughs> they are now. Okay. Um, again. Again. Um, try to wash your clothing without um, touching anything else. So it's nakedness and then right into the washer. And then I just place my shoes in the sun two days. That's all I've ever done. And I've never had a problem with my, sun, uh, my shoes. I think the sun really breaks down those oils uh, fairly rapidly. Um, that's anecdotal. Uh, I'm just saying that's not, that's just anecdotal. That's what I've done and I've never had an issue. Um, all right, let's keep cooking. Oh, new text post. Yeah, so Dawn, new tech, you can do any of those. That's post exposure. New text did say that it worked within, it still works within an hour. Is that kind of pushing it? Well, so um, from my understanding of poison oak, it's an allergic reaction. It actually travels under the skin. So once it penetrates, you know, you can get it here and it'll pop up here. And that's my understanding of it. So um, I'm not too sure about that one hour stuff. Um, yeah, I spent 10 years doing firework in uh, Marin County, and it was just part, 
you know, part and parcel of working in Marin County was poison oak. You just, so I just got used. Yeah, I hear that all the time. I, I'm not too sure. I'm not going to disvalidate that. I just don't have an experience with that, but I've heard that a lot. Okay, mugwort. Yeah, okay, mugwort. Thank you. Um, legal risk. Um, one, the very first thing is trespassing in private property. You just, it's illegal. If you went on to private property and forged from it, you could not only get cited for trespassing, but you could get cited for larceny. So there's that. Or you're just a fast runner, like me. <laughs> I have never gotten problems from foraging weeds on private property. Ever, never. People have just come. Yeah, right. That's what I typically get. Um, there's a lot of areas. California is overrun. Uh, we used to be a wild crafting state back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Uh, we used to have a wild crafting community where people would go into the wilds and make and do all kinds of stuff with the bounty that we had in California. And we just extracted too much. And everything is protected. You cannot take from state parks. You cannot take from the marine protected areas. And so there's a real... Um, real risk with taking from areas that are truly protected. This is a great example. This is Little Corona in Newport Beach, and this is rack. So I went down to the beach to get rack. Um, rack is delicious. Um, what I do with rack is just a seaweed. I just dry it out, absolutely dry it out, crush it up, and then add it to, it's your salt for all your dishes. So it's great on popcorn, and it's wonderful to get kids to eat their superfoods um, disguised as popcorn. Um, but it's, it's, but so this was on the high tide. It was above the high tide line. It's legal to take that. Um, I was able to forge that. This picture right here is in the actual tide pools and I would have gotten hit over the head with a little lady, uh, with a clipboard had I taken it there. And it, for good reason, we've over harvested these areas. When I was a child, we had abalone everywhere and clams, abalone, and oyster are all gone from Southern California. So we have these areas and hopefully we're bringing them back. Um, need license. If you are um, doing any kind of foraging stuff along the coast that's not in a marine protected area, such as mussels, we have a big mussel community in Southern California. If you've never had fresh mussels, they are delicious um, and they're abundant. Um, you still need a fishing license to do that. So you have to get it. The only exception is um, California's 138 public piers. You do not need a fishing license to fish from the piers or harvest the mussels on the pilings. Um, so that's really was an equity issue because piers create their own ecology and so they made that ecology available to um, all Californians. I thought it was a really neat law. Threatened or endangered species. Um, I don't know if I'd even know how to identify one of these because <laughs> they're like there, I never see them. Um, but if you took one of these, boy, you'd be in big, big trouble. So let's keep moving. Um, and here's the, the reason, what, some of the reason, when I um, started foraging up in Northern California, when I lived, and this is sea blight. It um, is a salty, succulent, delicious um, um, succulent that grows right along the coast. And it's abundant from Humboldt all the way into the Bay Area to Santa Cruz, Monterey, all has this. And I was determined to include it in my foraging book on Southern California. And I knew it was prevalent at one time in California. And so I took a bike ride. I did all of Southern California looking for this plant. And I finally found it at, this is the Seal Beach Naval's weapon station. So I'm actually trespassing. I had to go over a fence on federal naval land to get this picture. And uh, I was just, it was just tragic. And, but it's not this. It's just chia, sea blight, soap plant, wild onion are all losing their competitive advantages. One of my most glorious mentors, um, Charlotte, um, she wrote a book from the 1970s on foraging, which really got me into it. And sea blight, wild onion, um, chia were all in her book. They are so hard to find now. I, um, Charlotte, I just remember, I'm a little like my blood elsewhere right now. Um, I'll give you my email and I'll send you the book. It's phenomenal. She does an incredible job because she taught at Cal State Fullerton for um, decades and decades. And her, she has the recipes for every plant. She has the recipes. It's by far. And Amazon gets terrible ratings because all her 
images are drawings, and people are just so image driven now that they gave it poor ratings on Amazon, but it is by far the best foraging book I've ever read. Um, but she covers more natives than I do because by the time I got there 40 years later, there isn't a lot of wild onion and there's not a lot of soap plant. It's really disappearing. So next slide. So first, I'm just going to conclude. If you can't, Bree's going to uh, confer here. If you can't name it, don't eat it. Um, just don't do it. Um, wash and cook your food if you're at all concerned. It's taken me years to develop this uninhibitedness. If you went hiking with me, you're all, dude, slow down. Um, but if you're, you'll see, at first, start wash and cook your food before and develop that, that knowledge. Dress appropriately, no poison oak. Eat those weeds and have fun. Uh, this is in the Orange Hills. Um, and th this whole canyon is just incredibly edible. Next slide. Okay, top picks for Southern California. This is my favorite part. Okay, here we go. So this is the stuff I forage. You should be foraging every day. It's common in all neighborhoods. The city of Orange, Mission Viejo, Laguna Niguel, um, even in the IE. And you, you'll, from eating this stuff, you'll get plenty of vitamin, vitamins and nutrients, great digestion, and wonderful health. Next slide. So let's start. First, black mustard. <laughs> Of course, this is all alphabetical. So black mustard that's dotting our hills all over the place is a super duper incredible food. Every part of it is edible. The flour, so mustard is from the broccoli family. And when you eat the flowers, it's a spicy broccoli is what it tastes like. The flowers are divine. Uh, the leaf is incredible. It's a little too rich for me. I really need to cook um, black mustard, but you just throw it in broth, goat cheese, and you can eat anything. Um, but it is a soup. I'll, actually, I conclude my presentation with this one particular plant. Uh, but it is a super duper food, and there was a reason that the Spanish brought it over with them. All right, next slide. Uh, carob, of course, this is a tree that just loves people. It actually just loves our cars is what it loves. And it's sucking the nitrogen oxides out of the atmosphere. And it produces this fruit, which if you've ever eaten it right off the tree, addictive. You just cannot stop. Not, you feel like a little squirrel. Um, so during this time of year, I'll harvest whole big buckets of it. I actually compete with like some of my... I live um, on the Santiago Creek. It runs through Santa Ana and Orange. And we have um, carob along that whole creek. And there's these people that know those plants. And so like I'm duking it out with this one or two people every year. I hope I get there. You only eat the outer. You can't eat the seeds. It'd break your teeth. Okay. Yeah, you just wash it really good because it's been, you know, uh, our air quality. Uh, just wash it really good and then just start nibbling like a thing. No, no, I'm not. It's hanging from the fruit. I'm not worried about pathogens up there unless I see something, some sort of fungus in the tree, then I would do that. Um, but what I did here was I um, cut it up with the pruning shears and then put it in my coffee grinder and then I made pancakes and muffins out of it. So, um, you know, carob is a chocolate substitute. It is that rich and that sugary. Yeah. Have you noticed that the, I don't know if it's the male flowers, they have certain spots. Yeah. No, it's musky. It's pollinated by a wasp. So it needs that different, yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? I do if you email me. Email me. Yeah, I, I do. It's, uh, it's, or you could just Google carob. Yeah, Google images have better photos than I do. Uh, cheese weed. Oh, my God. I've eaten my garden out of this weed two times, and I'm now I'm just so determined to bring this plant back. It is so good for you. This is... I think my first or second favorite weed to forage. And the reason being is because it's so high in pectin. It is so good for your skin. And one of the reasons it makes this weed so good, not only because of its nutritional value, um, but it doesn't have a flavor. So what we do is we make um, at the Lyle Center, at the Regen Center, we'll make potato chips out of it. So we just harvest it, put it, we bake it, we put oil on it, put spices on it, bake it in the oven, and then just serve it to our group as potato chips, sort of like those chips. Just delightful. No really flavor at all. It can go, you can eat it fresh, you can make it cooked, it doesn't make a difference. Um, but what's interesting about this plant is it's really high in sapins which is sapins is a natural emulsifier, which is a natural soap. 
So you would take this plant, all the leaves, put it in a big pot of water, simmer it for about 30 minutes, let it cool down, and then just do a body wash. And you'll see it'll suds up, you'll get a good clean, but that pectin, your skin will shine after a bath with this. And this is historic, you guys. This is not, your, this is not some kind of coincidence. Your mother's spent tens of thousands of years establishing this relationship. Your biology with these plants is just, it's just how it works. I love this plant. Anybody know that Braiding Sweetgrass book? Yeah. Oh my God. So she divides her book into nations, you know, tree nation or something nation. So I, I taught a class out of that uh, book once and I had the students, okay, what nation are you from? Half the class said I was from cheese weed nation. <laughs> That's how prevalent this weed is. And once you get into it, you're all, you're pretty stoked to be part of Cheese Weed Nation. I'd be a cat though. Okay. okay. Uh, with the cheese weed, it said something about the shoots and stuff. Is, is that, are you talking about you can eat the... Uh, the shoots normally refer to the young sprouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there's nothing poisonous on the roots. You could eat them, but I don't know its nutritional value. I've never tried it. I would have used the roots for a soap. I would have just extracted the sapins from them. Yeah. What you were mentioning about it having a fruit? Oh, the fruit. That's how it got its name. Sorry, there's so much. Yeah, I could, I could do a whole semester on this. Um, the, the fruit looks like a cheese wheel, and that's why it got its name. So the cheese weed fruit is delicious. It almost tastes like a pine nut. Uh, so it's really a rich, wonderful taste. You just pop it in and chew it. You get your protein. You get your nutrients. Um, Well, the, the, they're, they're a disruption-oriented plant and an annual, so it'll be uh, five months after it sprouts, it's going to have its fruit. So it's, it's, um, it's a go-fast plant, kind of a punk rocker. It's got to get everything going on and done in five months. So it's, it's yeah. Look, you'll find the fruit once you spot it. it they're small, though. They're tiny, and they're um, and collapsed by the um, these sepals or something like that. So it's, like a pine nut. Yeah, like a succulent pine nut. And then curly dock, all the rumex are edible sorrels. If, you know, the French love to cook with sorrels. Um, this is, we have, this is our version of the sorrel that pops up in lawns. Anybody ever seen the Canadian geese all over our public parks, Mile Square Park and stuff? This is what they're eating. They're eating this and plantain and dandelion. That's why, that's why they're flocking to, that's why we should be eating the geese. Because um, that's our public money. <laughs> Anyway, this is uh, my neighbor's sorrel. It's so high in vitamin C and um, uh, um, acid that it really has this rich lemony taste. This is a really fibrous plant. It really needs to be cooked. So I would do this as a pot herb. I would combine it with um, some kind of noodles and soup and broth. Um, but it's really high in vitamin A and vitamin C, iron, potassium, everything we need to go, go, go. Next slide. Dandelion. Oh, my God. The bell of the ball. She is the queen of herbology. Everything. So I, I'm in elder care now, right now. You know, stage of my life. I'm taking care of my uh, dad right now, and and so I've overtaken his over, um, taken over his garden. So I've eaten out my garden out of dandelion like 40 times, and so now I have to colonize other gardens to grow dandelion. And so I've taken over my dad's garden and taken out the ornamentals to let the weeds grow a little bit more. And so if, if you turn this off, you'll see this incredible harvest I was able to get. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, he doesn't know. Anyway, I cannot speak enough about dandelion. You really want to fix yourself. You really want to go, go, go. You have a, a midterm exam. You have a, a, you know, an architectural exam to take. You have a biking adventure to go on, dandelion's your source. It will do everything. It will remove your toxins. It will boost your thing. It just greases the carbohydrates and the protein so you can get that clean transfer of energy. And every part is edible. Every part, from the flower to the stalk to the leaves. And, and the roots are incredible for the reproductive parts of a woman. They were long been a remedy. So just like the chicory, you would take the root, roast it up, grind it in your coffee grinder, and then make teas out of it. And it's a really earthy, wonderful taste. In fact, that's why I lost all the, the dandelion out of my garden, is I thought, oh, wouldn't that be sweet if I gave everybody dandelion tea on Valentine's to tell them how much I give? So I harvested all the dandelion in my garden, and it, the plant was all, screw you, we're not coming back. 
And so I haven't harvested dandelion from my garden for two years, and it's slowly coming back. Um, but you really should harvest, if you're really looking for the root, you need the second year. Um, don't ever take the first year. It's really immature root, so you really have to be patient with dandelion if you're going to harvest it. Um, but anti-inflammatory, antitoxins, like any beer drinker, this is your plant, okay? Because it really settles your system after that, because, you know, we, we're so inflamed after a good beer. Um, Oh, so that's just getting out in your neighborhood and getting to know your own thing, you know? Uh, um, uh, this is hard to explain. I've been carless for 13 years. I walk everywhere. I know all my neighbors' properties, and they all know me. And so I know, actually, which ones are using the pesticides and which ones aren't and which ones I can actually harvest and, you know, which neighbors would not send, sick their dog on me. And, and that's just time in your community. It's... You become a little more native to insight where you are. There's some, some aspect of when dandelion areas is a little more healthy than another area. Like the I look for size. size. Yeah, size. I'm looking for that second year plant. So I never take the first year. Oh, of course. Yeah, and in fact, you know, we're getting a lot more um, cautious about that. Like all LA County Parks and Rec refuses to use, it's a policy, they won't use um, pesticides on their lands anymore. And if they do, they put a dye in it. So it's really noticeable. So a lot of municipalities are making it more um, easygoing for both the wildlife and you. Um, yeah, let's keep on going, because I have another slide on this one. Elderberry, so both the native and the non-native, um, Wow, what a plant, what a giver. I, I, I could have written pages on this one. So during the pandemic, you couldn't get elderberry extract. It was gone, it was sold out because it is antiviral. It knocks stuff down and it's the berry if he um, talks out. Um, here he goes. Yeah, so um, I was lucky. I got this on the Santa Ana River Trail, on the bike trail, and it's just lined with elderberry, and I was um, just harvesting the elderberry and the flowers and the berries, and I was just, you know, this time of year, they're actually both in bloom on the same plant. So the berry itself, you have to um, cook it. There's an agent, I don't know the chemical in it, but it'll cause diarrhea, which might be good for some people. You never know. Um, <laughs> So you, but you can eat like four or five and it's no big deal. It, it, the taste isn't very distinguished. It's not very sweet and it's not sour. It's, it's not very distinguished, but boy, is it packed with everything you need. Um, but if you're really going to eat large quantities for any kind of viral control, so fever, cold, you're going to cook this and then make a syrup out of it um, and then add sugar to make it more palatable. What's really neat, though, is that the flowers, when they're dried, uh, make a tea that has been ancient. Uh, the Native Americans would have used it as a sedative and anti-anxiety. So what Native Americans did, from what I've read, was the mother would make a tea out of the, the flowers, cover her breast in it, and then when she was milking, she would actually calm her baby when milking. They would also use the tea for baby teething to help reduce the anxiety of teething. Um, but I would just use it to, you, you can see I'm a little excitable, so this is the kind of drug I need is just simmer down. Uh, what's neat is the flower also has a lot of sapins, just like the ceanothus flower, and it'll, it'll suds up and clean stuff. So just like the ceanothus flower, it's another good um, emulsifier. But it's more than that. Um, the plant is a natural um, rodent side. If you've ever smelt the leaf, it smells like cat's piss. And it is phenomenal. You just break off these branches, shove it in your gopher hole, and it's really a deterrent to large gophers. Um, and then the stalks of the plant are hollow, and that's what the natives would have made flutes out of and all kinds of musical instruments out of. And then the bast, the bast fiber, the inner bark, would have been um, fiber for ceremonial skirts. So this plant was revered. And there's little reason why that it grows so well next to humans, and it does, is because it's had 12,000 years of training on how to live alongside humans. So next slide. Fennel. Oh, man, this plant loves cars. Um, 
I think it is a car follower. I have found it on every major highway. I found it everywhere from Central Oregon to San Diego to the Inland Empire to the Sonora Desert. Um, as long as there's more than 11 inches of rainfall, you're going to find this plant. You can find this in the grocery stores. You can find it online. You can find it in the health food stores. Um, it is great for you. Uh, just high in vitamin C, super good with fiber and folate, magnesium. I, um, I actually use this plant if, if I'm constipated because it's so rich in fiber, it's like a scrub brush in your colon. I know I'm talking old guy stuff. This is old guy stuff, but this is like stuff on your brain when you get my age. Like it's easy to put it in. But, um, and the root is edible, the leaves are edible, the flowers are edible, and the seeds have that licorice taste. So this is one of the two plants that I got my nephews into foraging because the seeds taste like licorice. They loved it as a, you know, a seven-year-old. Yeah, I'll forage. Yeah, if everything tastes like this, I'm for it. Um, and it's seeding right now. This would be a great time to harvest it. You could get the flower, the seed, and the leaf all this time of the year right now. So, and it, it, it just loves. So you can find this in Newport Back Bay, all through here. Um, it's just super common, especially in the Bay Area. It really loves the Bay Area. Okay. Oh. This, so I told you there was two plants that followed me along the whole thing. One of them, poison oak. This was the other. This plant was on uh, outside the hospital where you were born. It was on every playground you ever played on as a child, and it'll be one of the first plants to colonize your gravesite. It loves humans, loves humans. You will never find it, ever find it in the wild. You will only find it around humans. It's fillery, it's not a superfood, but it is so abundant. This was a constant when I was foraging the coast. I mean, every meal had fillery in it, and it is just a slow, I mean, a low diminutive plant, um, you kind of sometimes have to brush other plants away, but it is everywhere, everywhere. Um, it's a cool season annual, so which means it really comes up um, like our coastal natives. It comes up in December and January with the first rains, and then it starts dying back in May and June. So it's, it's done for its season right now. We're not going to have a fillery season again until um, November, December. But... Um, Next slide. Which part of the plant? Oh, just the leaves and the flower. Yeah, leaves though, leaves. And there's no taste. It almost has a carrot-like taste, but there's almost no taste. It's a really um, coarse, um, fibrous plant. Goose foot and lamb's quarter. This is the mother of spinach, you guys. If you love spinach, so this is what brought you spinach is goose foot. So this is my garden. I have learned to live with goose foot. So this grows wild in my garden now. Um, I've learned how to establish that reciprocal relationship with it. So don't over harvest too much. Let it seed. Give it a little land. Let it spread. And I've really developed a good relationship with goose foot. I haven't quite eaten this one out of my garden yet. It tastes exactly like spinach. Um, you know that real rich irony taste that you get from spinach? This is what this plant tastes like. And goose foot has this almost same type of leaf, but it's just got that white underside or gray underside. Um, you can find this, this in every metropolitan area across the world. It loves, loves humans. It loves Lucy is what it is. It just loves Lucy. Um, but it's a superfood and really abundant. It's another cool season grower, so it's now falling out. We're going into the warm season annuals now. Next slide. Uh, nasturtium, <laughs> California Native Society loves to hate this plant, and um, um, it, it just, you guys have eaten this, right? It's delicious. It's like, wow, it's just, I, yeah. So the flowers, um, one of the things we teach at the Lyle Center, one of the first times in the field, I'll just pick up a flower and just shove it in my mouth, and students will just gasp, oh, um, I've learned, though, I should really check for bugs before I do that. Shake them out at least or something, you know, because I think I've swallowed a couple. Um, but the, the, the leaf, the seed, the flower, all edible. They have a real peppery taste to them. It's a real refreshing. It's a got a succulent. So to answer your question on cooking, um, this is one of those you would only flash boil. Uh, I would this plant would be preferable not to cook. So you'd really want to harvest away from dogs, away from animals, because that's your primary source of um, pathogens. So, um, but it's a domestic plant. You'll find it almost only in urban areas. So it, usually you find it in gardens. It's, what it is is if you're into IPM, 
integrated pest management. Um, this is considered a trap plant, that it pulls the aphids and the thrips from your preferred plants, and then you just chop up the plant, throw it in the green waste bin, and that's how you get rid of the pest problem. And so a lot of organic gardeners will have this plant in their plant palette as the trap, as part of their um, companion plant strategy. So it's just, if you've ever seen one of those hippie gardens, you'll find this plant. It's just, it's part of it. I shouldn't say that because it should just be part of our vernacular. Okay. Yep. You guys have all eaten this, right? Sour yes, sour grass. Who has it? So you've taken the stock and. And the flower seeds. Oh, you are doomed <laughs> in the best possible way. Yeah, another plant that I got my nephews into foraging was, you know, it's like that sweet sour candy that you get, but it's only the sour part. And they just loved it. They loved puckering up. And um, but the whole, what's really fun about this plant eating this plant is the corn. This is why we can't get rid of it. The corn is about six inches below the soil. In fact, they they developed a special herbicide just for this plant because it's so ill. And y'all, where are the cooks? We need more cooks. Um, so if you can dig up that corn and just roast it up, it is delicious. It's just a nut. It's just a nut. Uh, but you can eat, you know, this would just be every day. You just reach in if you trust it and just shove it in. It's just succulent. It quench your thirst. It's really lemony and sour. You can put it into drinks, lemonade. Yeah, you can do anything with it. Um, it's high in vitamin C. The only caveat with this plant is it really is high in oxalic acid. So if you have kidney stones or any kind of acid issue, you just have to tone down a little bit on this one. Um, okay, next one. Oh. You guys know this one? Bree does. The pineapple weed. So pineapple weed is so glorious. So this is a, a good tragic story. Um, I was engaged to a gal that lived in Petaluma, if you know where that is. Um, and so I had, to, from Southern California, every four weeks, I had to make that trek up for three years to go visit her. And it got so stressful to do that. I was so filled with anxiety and panic after a while, you know, because that long drive is just, uh, just so intense. The Tejon rest stop is the first rest stop when you're coming out of LA. Has anybody been to the Tejon rest stop? Yeah, yeah. The entire weedy landscape is pineapple weed. And so it was like, became my medicine. I was out of LA. I was going to see my gal, and I would just harvest a heck of a load of this stuff just to simmer my big butt down and <laughs> be able to tolerate that long drive. And it's camp meal. It's, it's a natural anxiety reducer and sedative. It really works. Yeah. So did you have any in your car? No, I brought a burner and just made coffee right there. No, that's how desperate I was. <laughs> yeah, little wonder I'm still single, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah, if I need Tejon rest shop and weeds to get through a relationship, I'm in trouble. Okay. Plantain. Uh, another word for uh, the common name for plantain is white man's footprint. It loves humans. So this is one of the reasons why we have the Canadian geese on all our parks is for this particular plant. More so this particular plant because it really lives under a blade. It loves trampoline. It can be your lawn. Um, it is nearly a superfood, super high in calcium, fiber, vitamin A, which is wonderful for your eyes. Um, it's really high in fiber, so you generally want to cook plantain. There's two types, the broad leaf and the narrow leaf. Both are equally edible. Um, this is my garden, and I actively encourage it, um, but it's not one of my favorite just because it is so fibrous. It's just a course, and I always have to cook it, so I feel like I'm cooking out some of that goodness. Yes, sir. Oh, by far, baby greens. The problem with the baby greens, though, is that it's that reciprocity, right? If you want it to spread and you want that goodness year after year, then you've really got to let it mature. And so there it's the, that's an ecologist. That's where we, how do we create a sustainable relationship with our land is we have to experience it. So when do we eat the baby greens and when do we eat the older ones and which ones do we let go seed and where do we let them go seed? That's the wonders of, of 22nd century ecology. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it's a spike. It just goes straight up. It's, I think it's wasp pollinated because it really doesn't have flowers. Um, so it's either wasp or wind pollinated. I know the seeds are edible, uh, but I, I don't know much about the flower. That was a really good question. Yeah. And this is the same plant that I've been using. Oh, my God. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yes. 
So if you're camping, so this plant loves all public bathrooms. You'll always find it around the back. It's the shade of the building and the moisture is what it loves. It doesn't love the bathroom. It loves the shade and the moisture. And so you'll always find it around your camping bathrooms. And what's cool about this plant is that it gets rid of bug bites. You just take a leaf, shove it in your mouth, really gnaw on it. You don't eat it. You just gnaw on it to break it down, let your saliva break it down, and then take that wad out and slap it on your bug bite and your bug bite will go on in three to five minutes. It's so powerful at that that your herbologist will make a salve out of that. Uh, they sell plantain salves just for bug bites, and it's really effective. So if you've got pets, you really want to encourage this um, because you're going to get fleas. So anyway, good, good. It's just, yeah, thank you so much for the bug bite thing. Prickly lettuce. Oh, man. We got to talk. You guys recognize this plant at all? I mean, it's everywhere right now. I mean, everywhere. It's a warm season annual, which means it comes up. It starts um, when everything else is, I've shown you is dying down. This plant comes out in abundance, and it's everywhere in my neighborhood right now, everywhere. And it's called prickly lettuce, or what they call it in the Midwest is opium lettuce. And so I um, got on this kick on natural medicines for a while, and I really dived into painkillers. And this is by far the most powerful natural painkiller I could find. It was um, revel revelationary when I had it the very first time. I really felt like I was talking to my ancestors. It, my DNA, I know that sounds funny, but we're so used to pharmaceutical solving problems. Um, this is Advil. See that right there? This is Advil. So Advil is, um, it thins out your blood. And I had a um, sciatic thing last week, and I didn't have this. And so I just popped just two Advil uh, two days in a row, and I had a contusion. And this is what happened when you thin out your blood. Advil is a, um, a minor spectrum painkiller. Uh, when you take Advil, you'll get constipated, you'll get thin blood, and you'll become agitated. You may actually become a little angry when you take it because it's not a full spectrum. This actually is just the opposite. It will help your digestion. It will, <laughs> it will help your mood. It will reduce the pain. It, your body has evolved. It's taken us millions of years to truly be able to, our DNA to link up with this plant. And it's little wonder why it is so abundant everywhere. We need painkillers in our urban communities. We are so hot and intense. Yes? Uh, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, so when it's young, the baby greens, uh, the baby greens, you can harvest it just like you would dandelion and you can eat it. But as it gets older, you would harvest this stock. So this stock is just weeks away from harvesting. I harvest when it, only when it's blooming. So when it has flowers or seeds on it, I'll take the top of the stalk from right about here, harvest all that without the flowers, and I'll, uh, about three of those plants I'll take, and I'll chop them up into little bits, put them in, a, wash them in water first, get the dust off, get all that stuff off, and then I'll take them to a flash boil, um, uh, kill all the pathogens, and then I let it simmer, I mean super low simmer for about 90 minutes until it's absolutely blanched, yeah. Yeah, it's it, lactorium acid is what it is. Yeah. I have never heard anything about that. Um, I know there are other latexy plants like the euphorbias where people have severe allergies to and severe reactions. I, Bree, have you read anything about reactions to this plant? No, I, I've never, I haven't even read anything and I did my due diligence. But again, right? Right, you put it on your lips first, see if you have a reaction, put it in your mouth, then if you don't, you're probably good to go. But believe me, your ancestors coveted this plant, coveted this. Can you imagine you were hunting and foraging and gathering without shoes day in and day night, day in and day out? Painkillers would have been hugely important to you, and this was it, this was their Advil. This is your Advil, your DNA is linked to this plant. Every part of it is edible. The flowers, the seeds, the stalks, the roots. This is part of the bitter green clan, which includes the dandelion. So it's related to dandelion. Um, 
Yeah, I just take, so I'll do two things. First, once I'm simmering and I'll take the vegetation out, I'll just take a cup and drink it right then. And then I'll bring it right back up to a flash boil and then can the rest for future drinks. So that's how I keep the pathogens out of it. I'll actually boil it and then can it to let that happen with the can. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I'll preserve it. Right. Uh, I will eat the baby leaves, but it is so bitter at that stage. It is almost too bitter to eat. And there's other greens. I'll show you some other greens this, for the um, warm season stuff. Yeah. You're still getting the vitamins in that light sim in that simmer, though. I mean, you're, that 90 minutes in that bath completely blanches it. You've extracted everything. All the vitamins, all the lactorium, you've ex extracted everything. Yeah. Uh, prickly pear cactus, this can be found, uh, you know, throughout. This is a, a native plant. I don't have too many natives here, but it loves humans. It grows around humans. My neighbor, I grow avocados, so I give him my avocados, and he gives me his Nepalis, um, and it's just a really good swap. Um, so um, these are just delicious. It, you guys have all had Nepalis. Yeah, it's wonderful. I love Nepalis. Really good for your skin, really great health. Uh, the fruit is absolutely wonderful, but I'm really going to encourage you to go online and go to a YouTube video before you eat it because those glockids are so terrible on that fruit. Uh, that is where my face touching episode happened and I got glockids right up in here and it was terrible. So uh, we actively grow and harvest these at where I teach at the Lyle Center, but we actually grow them for this, the cochineal, um, that little beetle. Um, to make the cochineal dye. So um, the cochineal dye is what's in your milkshakes, your strawberry milkshakes is cochineal. It's in your lipstick. Um, cochineal has been used as a dye forever, but it's normally associated with crimson red. And you need a mordant, you need a chemical to get that crimson red. Without any chemicals, you're gonna get this more purpley color out of it. But imagine a royal purple a thousand years ago would have been an incredibly hard color to get. And so it's revered in some cultures, this cochineal bug. So, um, yeah. So, Nepalis and Tunas. Next slide, please. Um, and then purslane is a warm season. This is, I grow this in my driveway. I have a gravel driveway. And this is what I propagate in my, I don't propagate it. I just don't over harvest it, is what I do. And I always, how I help this plant spread is I pull out the grasses. So I just give it room, and it is my driveway is covered in this plant right now. I don't drive, so. Um, and it's a whole nother presentation. Um, that's my least favorite question. Um, so. So, 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 the, the purslane is a rich, lemony, succulent taste. It will just quench your thirst. It is just so good for you. Um, you can eat it fresh. You can eat it raw. Here, I just throw it. I just wash it. Um, I trust my gravel driveway, and I just throw it in my um, guacamole. I'll just take um, lemon and, and um, avocados and salt and pepper. Like the, the whole, that whole summer. thing. Yeah. A whole, whole darn thing. Yeah. Yeah, if nobody's looking, I'll just shove it all in. Yeah, it is. They sell this in grocery stores. It is so good for you. They sell this in grocery stores. Yeah, uh, you can go to a bougie restaurant and they'll charge you more for purse lane. Just come to my driveway. Um, yeah, but what makes um, purse lane so attractive is it's those mega threes, those bone and um, muscle recovering um, Brain health, omega 3s. The best protein for you is the omega 3s, most digestible. Okay, let's keep cooking. Wild radish. So, this is another mustard relative. Um, it's just, um, it grows along the coast. It prefers the central and, and northern coast, but um, I know they have it all over through the Newport Bay. They have it in San Clemente. Um, it just loves the coastal areas. You can find it within 10 miles of the coastal areas throughout the entire coast. And it is the mother of radish. This is where radishes were bred from. The whole plant tastes like radish. Um, so when I'm foraging it, I'll eat the flowers, the seeds, the leaves, and I'll even pull up the root, slice it up, boil it, because it is really hard. It's not a typical radish. Um, it's only about that round, but it's just as red. Um, and just boil it up and, and get rid of some of that woodiness. And you really get that rich radish flavor um, in there. Um, 
Oh, man, you want to talk about a fortifier, like somebody that got your back? This plant, you can find this in every health food store. You can find it in my route. I live in the hood. You can find it in my Ralph's. This plant is so good for you. In fact, this my tea today, I didn't know what kind of crowd you were going to be, so I was going to fortify myself, and I put stinging nettle in my tea today just to ward off any craziness. That's it, yeah. Um, so it is a cool season grower, comes up in December, January, and it is abundant. This is the people following. This is not the native. Um, and it is such incredible. It, calcium, iron, magnesium, potassium, vitamins A, C, D, and some K, they're anti-inflammatory, um, and they help reduce the severity of um, allergies. Uh, they definitely improve feelings of well-being. When I eat a lot of, um, so I'll harvest mass amounts in um, February and March, and then I'll dry it out to make sure there's no fungus, and then I'll store it up and make soups out of it the rest of the year. And so if I have a weird family thing coming, it's stinging nettle soup. If I have a group I've never met before, stinging nettle tea. Anytime I need to ward off bad stuff, it's stinging nettle. <laughs> Not that... Uh, you, I, it, it, when it's fresh, I just do it fresh. Why even bother? But yeah, you can dry it. I think you lose a little in the drying, but I'm not too sure. Um, that's just a guess. Oh, just drying it or cooking it, steaming it, anything. Yeah, you can steam it. Anything will get rid of the steam. Now, that if you've really worked with nettle, um, this covers the Lyle Center regenerative studies. We really encourage it. That's where this picture was taken. And if you work around it long enough, you actually feel that the sting becomes hallucinogenic after a while. And it's really weird that you get these other sensations when you get stung by it. So I've known some people that actually intentionally sting themselves because the sting only lasts for 20 minutes, period. It's gone in 20 minutes, but the sensation persists. Now, if you've ever been stung by the native, so I went up to Humboldt to harvest the native um, for um, fibers, for baskets and stuff. I really wanted to work with the fiber because that would have been the linen of native Californians. And so I intentionally got myself stung thinking, oh, it's just this one. Oh, woof. It was 24 hours and the hallucinogen lasted about 36, 48 hours. Yeah, I learned to stay away. I was just, so that was a bit much for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, and then most people that kind of brush against it, they'll, they'll just have to live for a few seconds, and then, but there is no other uh, byproduct. Or okay, so okay. So is, is there a lot of different variations? That, not that I know of, but um, not that I know. How can you tell the difference between the native and the non-native? Okay, the native grows about this tall, and it is vigorous. The leaves are about this big, um, and it grows about this tall. It's a lighter green. Um, whereas the native, the people follower, is only about um, about that tall. It's a smaller leaf, and that's the difference. Uh, but you cannot find the native down in Southern California. I don't think you can. I start. I couldn't even find it in the Bay Area. I had to go above Mendocino to really run into the native. That would be the native. Okay, that would be the native. Because this is just a people follower. You won't find this one in the wilds. It prefers our impact on the land, not a bear's, not a cougar's. It prefers our impact. So, yeah, you, you found the native. Um, if you, how old of a plant would you like, like to harvest? Because I've noticed it right after rains, and then it's like you go back like two weeks later, and it just looks like it's done. You, uh, um, you, for taste reasons, you always harvest before it uh, sets seed. Okay. It just changes. As soon as it sets seed, it, it stops giving energy to the leaves and stops the chlorophyll, stops, and it just, all its energy is going into reproduction. And so we try to harvest at the Lyle Center. I try to harvest all mine well before it sets seed. So as young as possible, like six to nine inches tall. And feel free, just weed whack it. It, is, um, it had evolved to mass predation events. It, it, it's hooked up into that kind of predation. Um, yeah, I, just try it once and you'll be hooked on what, or just go to your health food store and get a jar of it. They, it's so good for you. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, flowers. This will be fast. You know, um, all, most all flowers are edible because you really don't want to poison your pollinator, right? <laughs> you don't want to, it's a third party reproduction. You don't want to, that's like, uh, yeah, you just don't want to do your, your, your third party. So um, it's just some of the most funnest edible flowers are the, all the rose petals. Rose petals have been eaten for centuries. You know the hip. So roses are related to the apple family. The rose hip is edible, tastes like an apple. Old remedy for colds and, and headaches and stuff. Uh, but the petals, uh, they taste like tissue paper or your grandmother's perfume. So either one of those two. Uh, my nephews just love foraging citrus flowers. And citrus flowers can go on top of ice cream, could go on top of cakes, could go on top of everything. And the neat thing about citrus petals, it's actually the petals. You don't want to eat the reproductive parts, just the petals. The neat thing about the petals is um, the flower, the plant produces far more flowers than fruit. So you're actually not diminishing your the, the quantity of fruit you're going to pull from getting this. And every tree tastes different. So, you you know, a tangerine is going to taste way different than a lime petals. And so it's really fun to, to just eat citrus petals. Uh, kids really love that one. Uh, next slide. Every member of your mint family has produces edible flowers. So what are some of the mint family members? Salvias. salvias. Yeah, so all your sages, all your salvias. Lavender. Lavender. Rosemary, sneezing, basil, oregano, um, spearmint, pennyroyal, all those flowers are edible. So I've tried to, find, I've tried to eat as many um, members of the Min family as I possibly, I'll just walk around, like Linda told you, just poof. And um, this is by far the sweetest of all the salvias. Um, the hummingbird says, you know why the hummingbirds go crazy over it, like you're duking it out. Um, they are that sweet. Um, and then my favorite probably is the rosemary flower because it looks so delicious on a salad or anything you cook, and it has that rich rosemary taste. Um, and you just, what you do is just grab the petals and pluck it. You really don't want the reproductive parts. You're just grabbing the petals and just pull it out. This is the mimulus is not part of the mint family. I don't know about that one. Yeah, yeah, it does. No, actually, now that you say that, yeah. Um, all the primroses are edible. We have the native, um, the California evening. This is the one that's coming out right now. It's a warm season grower, so it's really bursting right now. You can find this throughout Southern California, especially in my creek. Um, has a real rich tissue paper taste to it. Same with this one. This is the uh, non-native, uh, but it's just more ornamentation on your foods, you know, just to get people engaged. It's just, it's just fun. Um, these flowers, both the yucca and the um, agave, are wonderful flowers. They taste like cucumbers. And, but the thing is that they are so delicious, they're usually full of ants. So I always um, wash my flowers in a little thing of warm water again, right? Uh, push those toxins out because our environment is so dusty here. Um, but this was in Manhattan Beach, and I just forged this thing. This was by my uncle's house, and I saw this and just pulled over on my bike and just ruff. Um, they are delicious, just wonderful. And what they are is they're so thick and succulent, they're really fun to eat. It's not like the tissue paper. It's You have something actually to bite, like purslane. It's, it's, it's like it's got texture. It's, oh, yeah. People, yeah, people love you if you do this. Uh, the pineapple guava parking lot in Southern California. Pine, pineapple guava is so well planted because it's, an, it's a small tree that doesn't buckle sidewalks. So it's so common from the Bay Area to San Diego. You'll find it. Um, landscape architects love using it um, because it grows in any condition. Um, but this whole flower, so this is the reproductive parts. The sweets are in here. It is really the sweetest flower. All right, Brie confers. It's... It, uh, it, it's just, it, it's, it, is be, it is so good that we eat the flowers and not the fruit on this plant where I work. We don't even care about the fruit. We just can't wait for the flowers when they come out. It's, it's really candy. And then dandelion. So I, we talked about that lactorium acid um, as a painkiller. Well, the dandelion's part of that clan. And so um, what I use dandelion flowers are for depression. 
I will just take five or six dandelion flowers, uh, pour boiling water over it, let it seep for um, 10 minutes, and then just drink it. And you will just feel calmer. You'll just feel better about your day and your life. Maybe not about your spouse, just, <laughs> just about your day and your life. And I swear it really works on depression and just f elevating feelings of well-being. Um, and it's historic. Your body knows what to do with it. So if you're having a bummer day, just go to your park. They're everywhere. I had a question about the dandelions because I was just wondering because, like, yeah, you see some like this that have like really short leaves and really small plants, and then you yeah. see ones like you harvested that have like really long leaves. The, all, so this is first year. Corn. This is first year, okay. and it's the second year where you really get those longer leaves. Uh, it's a lot of it has to do with its environment. So is a lawnmower going over it? Yeah. Um, yeah, if it's really sunny, they prefer a little shade. So if it's really sunny, they're going to stay smaller as a compact. They don't have to grow to get their metabolism done. Yeah, so it could be um, how much UV it's getting and how much moisture it's giving. It loves water. So this is why you'll find it in lawns. It just loves water. It, what it loves is our compaction. It loves compacted soils. It loves our, the weight and the impact that we have on the soil just crushes the first three to four inches of the soil, but leaves everything else very um, oxygenated because we're only so heavy, we can only compact so much. And they've evolved to just that level of compaction. So, and then uh, my all time favorite flower. You guys know this one? Oh, man. This was revered in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. They made candies out of this. They gave it to gifts. This is the flower for Valentine's Day. It is the flower that most represents love because the, the leaf is shaped like a um, heart. And so this is the plan I give for Valentine's Day um, to my sister. You have no question. Okay, but the flower is so sweet, so sweet. You'll know why they made candy out of it. It is just delicious. It's so we covet it. Um, there's a small foraging group at Cal Poly Pomona, and there's two patches on campus, and it is a well kept secret where these two patches were. I'll bring this up every in all my classes, but I'll never tell the students where this is ever. It's like because the fly, it, the flowers would be gone. I'd, I'd never get any. And they're just that sweet. Um, if you're going to grow this in your garden, you are going to grow it on the north or east side of your house. They do prefer shade. In, in the Bay Area, the northern coast, it's a weed. On the east coast, it's a vicious weed. They hate that plant on the east coast because it just is overrun. But in Southern California, it's just a little hot. It struggles here. So, OK, poisonous plant. This is uh, not too fast because this is really not this conversation. So these are the, uh, there's really not too much. Castor bean. You guys familiar with castor bean? It's a car follower, believe it or not. It's cleaning up our atmosphere. Death cannas, we can only find those in the mountains. Ivy hedra, which is poisonous, um, but it also makes a phenomenal soap. It's so high in sapins, it's a natural body wash. Jimson weed, that's the hallucinogen that makes you puke and die. Doesn't sound very attractive, does it? Yeah, no, I've never done that one. Lupin, there's actually only two species of the hundreds that are um, poisonous, but I'm just going to say lupin. Um, mistletoe, so for you tree climbers, don't eat the mistletoe. Uh, oleander, <laughs> okay, everybody knows this. Poison hemlock, I have a slide for that. Poison oak. Poodle dogbush, you guys know poodle dogbush? Oh, I. Okay, yeah, you're a hiker. Only the hikers. So this, what's so great about this? I don't have a picture of it because it's not an urban plant. You can't find it in urban areas at all. But it, it follows the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico all the way into the Sierras. So we get all these overseas people, and it has this beautiful blue flower. And people just get off the plane, they get on the trail, they see a blue flower, they touch it, and then they're infected for the next four weeks. What? The flower looks kind of like a Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah, it makes you want to, yeah, it's very elusive. Uh, but what, this is really, this is an urban presentation. Spurge, so any of your euphorbias, so that uh, euphorbias are your um, poinsettias that you get at Christmas. This is a euphorbia. If you broke the stem, you'd have that white sap. That latex is nasty. So if you get that white latex on you and then you put it in sunlight, you'll get an instant reaction. It just is a scarring right off the bat. And so the spurges, the petty spurge and the gopher plant um, and the spotted spurge 
um, are all very common. The spotted spurge sort of looks like um, purslane, so that would be a look-alike. Uh, stinging nettle, only because of the sting, that's why it's on this plant, this, and then water hemlock. I have a slide for that. So by far the most poisonous is uh, poison hemlock. You can find this throughout the entire state. It's in San Mateo State Park. It's in um, the hills, in the ravines of where we are. Um, Elisa Viejo, the, the stream that comes down that bike trail, it's there. It's along um, the Santiago Creek. Um, and this is from Cal Flora. Uh, if you ever go to Cal Flora and you want to know the distribution of a weed or a native, you can just go on and they've mapped through volunteers, uh, mapped sightings of this plant. And you can see it's fairly coastal. Um, it just doesn't like that hard freeze that the mountains provide. So it loves it more. It's a um, cool season. But what's, you can tell this plant by the spotted stems, the carrot-like leaf, but really you tell it by the smell. As soon as you break it open, it screams, do not eat me. It's a rank smell. Uh, you'd have to be cuckoo pants to, or just very courageous to even get that in your mouth, pass that. It, the smell is terrible. Uh, you know, I've read that uh, touching it is noxious. Um, I've read that a lot, but I've touched it a hundred times just to make sure people knew the smell of it. Yeah, I've never had a reaction with a touch. But, and I've read that. Yeah. Um, so, but I've never... Yeah, this is the plant that killed Socrates. They made a detoxin of it, and then they gave it to Socrates. And um, I don't think it's a very comfortable death, though. I don't... Um, okay, next slide. Poison oak, again, you can see the coastal influence. It just doesn't like the, the really cold temperatures of the upper mountains, but everywhere else, as long as you're getting more than about 10 to 11 inches of rainfall, you're going to find poison oak. So, um, and then next slide. Uh, and then uh, the western water hemlock. This is a native plant. I've never seen it in the wild. So, but I'm an urban forager, so um, I... Um, I don't, it's not, I haven't seen it in any urban area ever. And that's, I'm just going to stop with that one slide and just say, I have not seen this plant and I've not run across it. Um, okay, here's the conclusion. Here we go. What's the plant in that picture? Yeah, everybody knows it, right? It's everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. That picture could have been taken in Central California, San Diego, could have been taken in the IE, could have been taken in Oakland. Really, black mustard is that widespread. California's changed, you guys. Do you know the story of black mustard and how it got here and why it's here? Okay, I've heard that story. Um, but uh, I went to the Sherman Library and went to the old accounts and stuff and talked to a lot of um, historic botanists about this plant. I really wanted to find out what happened with this plant. This is what I found out. So it was intentionally shipped over with the Spaniards, the missionaries, um, in the 1700s. And they did so for scurvy. They brought their cure for scurvy with them. They brought the one plant they know that would grow around them no matter where they landed. Can you imagine coming from Europe to a land that no one has ever been on? You didn't know if you had your scurvy cure, and if you've been on a boat, scurvy was one of the number one fears. They brought their cure for scurvy, and they naturally planted it around all their missions. It never, ever spread. All the early accounts said, yeah, it just kind of languished around the missions. Native Californians got immediately hooked into the plant. Everybody was eating it. It had all the vitamins, all the nutrients, everything everybody needed, but it never spread until the 1950s. What happened in the 1950s? Nope. The great car culture. It was the first time that everybody had a car. Very first time. No time in any history did a teenager have a car. What happened is nitrogen oxides is what changed our state from this to that. We went from something to something else. What is the nutrient most needed by plants? Most needed. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is what the chloroplasts use to break the water molecule to create the potential energy that drives their whole metabolism. Nitrogen drives photosynthesis. Without it, you languish. 
right now, next slide. Sorry, I thought we were already on that. Right now, Southern California's drive, this is according to the South Coast Air Quality Management District, Southern California's drive 400 million miles a day and emit 199 tons of nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere every day. We are pumping the atmosphere full of plant food. Loads of plants can pull it from the atmosphere. So if you've ever worked in a greenhouse, if you have a hort degree, you know that you pump these. So 95% of the mass of a plant comes from the atmosphere. Only 5% actually comes from the soil. So you can pull iron, magnesium, nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, all that stuff can come from the atmosphere. And if you work in a greenhouse, you know you pump it into the atmosphere of your greenhouse to get your poinsettias, to get your tulips bloom faster, to grow more, and we are living in that greenhouse right now. We are pumping these out. We are pumping everything out. Carbon is what the plants need more than anything. Nitrogen is what the plants need more than anything, and we all contributed today. And then sulfur acidifies the soil, which makes it more benign. So we would have had an alkaline soil prior to European um, prior to the 39 million residents, and now we're about neutral pH evolving to acidity in California now. We've changed the soils, we've changed the atmosphere, and as a consequence, we have this. Mustard found along the entire state. It is an absolute car follower. It is native to cars. Which brings me to this. Dig in. Man, your mother loves you. We love to vilify humans and our impact on our land, but we have an ecology which can be really good. What if we just leaned into the ecology that we created? We're so fixated on this ecology that happened 300 years ago. That's how we define nativeness right now. Whatever happened three years ago is the gold standard. We're, that exit, that off-ramp is 300 miles behind us, 300 years behind us. This is our present. All the plants I showed you live off your impact. They live because you exist, because your mother set a precedent on this planet, and she created a relationship with these plants. What if we leaned into this nature that we created? Could that be a path to sustainability? Could that lead us to different outcomes instead of glorifying a landscape that existed 300 years which we can no longer create. And we proved it tonight. We drove here. And absolutely everybody here, Sierra Club, knows that fossil fuels is what's driving this planet to hell. And each one of us contributed. What if we leaned into that very nature and celebrated that drive and didn't see it as a cost to the environment, but were able to actually harvest those oxides and create that benefit? Because ecology doesn't know good or bad. They just know inputs and things are changing, right? Good or bad comes from us. We're we have, we're the ones who are value, we value things. We are objective, but if, I mean subjective. Yes, ma'am. Isn't the solution to just plant more plants? I mean, isn't that what that Well, means? I don't have a solution. Uh, I'm, let me just finish this. Uh, let, let's get, that's the discussion I was going to have last. Th so this is just a common everyday meal at my house. This is, but my nature, these are the plants that my impact on this planet created. And I'm leaning into that nature instead of vilifying it with herbicides and pesticides and bad words. Well, what do we use? What kind of language do we use for non-native plants? A weed, invasive, a planet killer, non-native. I just want to say um, that this took eight months to make. And these are all the dyes I was able to get within uh, two miles of my house and walking. So I harvest every color from within two miles of my urban areas. We, there is so much richness, you guys. We just need to lean in a little bit more to the very, you just love yourself because I'm convinced since I got into foraging, you're, my mom loves me. Like she's always got my back. She's got the cold, she's got the broken bones, she's got the digestive problems. She's, I feel like I'm really handled. So I think I just wanna conclude with this last slide and, um, like, do we need a new definition? Like, we know it's native to the state 300 years ago, but what's native to 39 million invasive 
humans. What's native to 16.7 million cars? What's native to tens of millions of dogs and cats? Lights, air pollution, sound. What is native? Because that has a nativeness. That has an impact. And as a consequence, it's going to have an ecology. What if we leaned into that ecology? What if we relied on our impact on the land a little bit more than what happened 300 years ago? I'm just asking because we need to do something. Our world's on fire. Anyway, that's where I'm going to stop, and I'm just going to open it up to questions and discussion. Is yes, ma'am. Uh, you know the wild that sold that yeah. Are yeah. There Super edible. It's considered a famine food. It was, it supports so the Western migration when all those people were coming to settle the West during the gold rush. That was their food they ate. So the root is edible, the seed is edible, the flower is edible because it's, it's an artichoke, and the leaf is edible. Yep, the whole thing's edible. Yeah, it's good roughage. Um, so as an environment, can we do the last slide? The, the, as environmentalists, I grow food. I try to take care of my own health in my own garden, so I grow my own food and medicine. But my food is all wood crops. I refuse to do animals because those are the high energy, high water crops. And so I go for the low energy, low water, more crops. So, well, not low water, but um, so, so I have this lower level that I've never planted. It's just a pasture. And that's where I let the weeds spread. So my canopy is my food, and the pasture is my medicine, is how I've treated my garden over the years. Yeah. Sort of like the food forest permaculture concept, in a way. Yeah. 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 These are some of the other books. If you're, um, yeah, there you go. If you're in fire country, um, that is the best-selling book in the nation on uh, landscaping for fire protection. So, anyway. Did I keep you awake? OK. Thank you, guys. You're brilliant. Oh, yeah. That was good, though? OK. All right, good. Oh, great. I, I just want. I never had this on. A, um, a variety of different activities, hikes, and that sort of thing, if you're interested in hiking in South Orange County.